Well, we see very clearly that uh, the world economy is slowing down significantly. That translates in less jobs, less opportunities, but also uh, more poverty. What we are seeing that as a result of the COVID crisis, but also at the ongoing crisis worldwide, we see extreme poverty again increasing. Our latest estimates put this increase at 70 million people. So over 700 million people are extreme poor. And in fact, that is people living below $2.15. But if you take a broader measure of people living less than $7 a day, that's 47% of the world population. So this is a very clear concern. People are hurting, and that is what feel. What is also important of this type of meetings is, yes, we are difficult times. We are, de however, we are determined to determine to act fast and decisively with support that can come from multilateral institutions like the World Bank. Particular areas of concern at the moment, uh, either geographic or, or in their nature. Well, I think uh, the clear concerns, starting with the war in Ukraine and the enormous fallout, this is a mega concern and we need to act and we have been acting. Secondly, we need to, to focus on the poorest countries here, particularly uh, in Africa, very difficult times, as well as what we call the fragile states. They can be in, in the Sahel zone, it can be Afghanistan, it can be Haiti. All these uh, countries require massive support and here the bank has been stepping up to provide critically needed financial and technical assistance support. You talked about Ukraine. Just to circle back, we've seen a recent escalation in the attacks on Ukrainian cities by Russian cruise missiles. Um, could you just describe for us your feelings about this latest escalation and ultimately how much more difficult that makes the job of the World Bank here to assess the support and funding that Ukraine needs? Well, I think it is devastating. The World Bank was created at the end of the uh, Second World War and had a very clear mission on reconstruction. It has a peaceful mission. So anything that violates is, is clearly also in violation of the ideals and of the mission of the bank. What is very important is it has been a terrible suffering of the people. And that is uh, what uh, now is required is solidarity, solidarity with Ukraine and a need to act and provide as much support as possible. We are not engaged in the military area. That is not our uh, mission. But in the economic and social areas, yes, we have. What we have been doing after the outbreak of of the war, we have created a platform to provide basically support directly to the World Bank, through co-financing, parallel financing, through funds of, of, of grants by donors. And we have succeeded to mobilize $13 billion, of which $11 billion have been dispersed. Clearly, this is only a part of the support. Much more needs to be done. And I think that these attacks show we have to stand uh, with uh, Ukraine in solidarity. But most important, we have to continue financial support so that the functions of the state can continue, the social needs of the people are met, and ultimately we need to again uh, focus on reconstruction. There does seem to be self-inflicted damage to the global economy occurring at the moment. Uh, and we've seen that in the oil uh, supply cut from OPEC plus. Again, this is increasing inflationary pressure. It is making it much harder for countries that import energy to meet their energy costs. Um, what message for OPEC plus at this time? Well, the message is that any of the measures, uh, uh, any of those uh, groups need to uh, consider not only their self-interest, but really the further ramifications for the world economy and especially for poor countries. What all these measures means is, is that the life of many of the developing countries, and particularly the poorest, are getting more difficult and what we are seeing, more poverty. And I think here uh, all countries should consider these impacts in difficult time because there is a direct link between all these measures on 
the poor. And I think we are seeing that in the most dramatic area in food security, uh, that basically food insecurity has dramatically increased. And all these increases in food prices have a direct impact on the poor because the higher prices mean more poverty. And I think people need to equate higher prices on food is equal with higher poverty. And certainly where we are sitting, that is A, unacceptable, and secondly, we need to act with support. And the bank is trying through a program uh, uh, up to $30 billion to deal with the food-related issues. This is part of a coalition with uh, countries as well as also multilateral institutions. But clearly, a lot more meat needs to be done. And those countries that can influence the price, they should be aware that one should actually try to uh, not inflate more. The Fed seems very clearly still to be on a path of, of tackling inflation through higher interest rates. But the consequences of this for anybody with debt in dollars are clear to see. And we've seen the interest servicing costs rise massively for many emerging economies at this point. Um, the Fed will do what the Fed is going to do, but do you think they need to be taking notice of the consequences of this for the dollar and its impact on emerging economies that you support? Well, I think clearly that any of the monetary policies by OECD countries are taking uh, uh, the needs of their countries in, uh, into account, but they have broader impacts. And certainly what we are monitoring very carefully is the debt situation of many developing countries, uh, how much this will affect, how much actually this could also cause uh, debt distress in developing countries. This is an area where we have been pointing out uh, regardless only on the monetary policy, there are many other factors that influence their debt situation that we need to uh, pay very close attention in the, uh, to this issue, and particularly in the poorer countries, that we may need more debt relief. How big a risk of a sovereign debt default domino is there, do you think, at this time? I, I think we're all very worried about contagion now and the possibility that we could see more than the current four countries that have defaulted on their sovereign default. How real is the likelihood of that? Well, I think that uh, the international system has become pretty good to actually deal with selective uh, debt problems of countries and try to contain that. I think that we are monitoring the situation uh, carefully. Uh, I don't think that one should speculate on, an, on a generalized default wave. Let me just ask you about the criticism that the, the bank has received. Janet Yellen, the Treasury Secretary, has talked about shifting the way that the bank approaches its support, less country specific, maybe more sector or topic focused. Um, David Malpass, of course, has also had some personal criticism about uh, his comments around climate change, and the bank has been accused of supporting the carbon industry over the last 10 years. There's a, there's a lot in there, but it clearly would indicate that there's an appetite for some reform of the organization at this point. Well, first of all, there is always a need for a robust uh, discussion. If you are in a big uh, development institution, you will attract criticism, suggestions. I think uh, we should welcome uh, uh, this kind of robust debate. There should be, however, a couple of things clear. First, I think what uh, uh, Secretary Yellen has been suggesting is, I think, should be uh, discussed. I, for once, would say I would welcome this because we should see international organization in a dynamic matter. Uh, and and there are many changes in the world economy occurring. The basic question is, how can we serve the membership in the best possible ways? And here one should not be dogmatic. They'll say, this was the way we did in the last 10 years. We cannot change. We need to change. There are new uh, uh, challenges you have seen uh, in, in terms of, 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 of violence in the world, but also climate change that requires stepped up efforts. And I think the old suggestion that she is making and others are making should be welcomed as a part of the debate uh, to, to make the bank second. What is very clear in all this discussion, be it Secretary Yellen and other suggestions, what they are suggesting is that there should be a stronger World Bank, a bigger bank to respond to this global crisis. 
I happen to agree on this, and let's have that discussion with our membership. That's important. The other part is clearly that uh, we get criticism left and right about it. I, I, I actually think that's okay. What is uh, important is it should be on the basis of facts. The fact is that the World Bank has massively increased, as nobody else, climate financing. We are 150% committed to the climate uh, uh, agenda. It is here to stay. And what we have been doing only in the last uh, two, three years, since 2019, our, uh, our commitments to climate finance has increased from 14 to 26 billion dollars and more is to come. What we think is more needs to be better. What we would like to have is that there is a broader coalition, not only on the World Bank, but the other institutions as well as bilateral stepping up and particularly uh, working with developing countries. Developing countries need massive support, financial support to deal with this challenge. Take the coal exit. It will cost only in Asia nine to thirteen trillion dollars over the next twenty years. We need to see how we can work with these countries, including finding financial solutions. We believe we can make a significant uh, contribution, but much more needs to be done.